So I would like to start this session by acknowledging this land is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, peoples. I acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. I also acknowledge that all treaty peoples, including those who came here as settlers, as migrants, either in this generation or in generation past, and those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly forcibly displanted Africans, work here as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. Welcome everybody to this information session hosted by the City of Toronto Shelter Support and Housing Administration for the shelter at the Roehampton Hotel and the Interim Housing 5565 Broadway. We have um, Mayor John Tory with us, um, as well as Councillor um, Josh Matlow and Rachel Lunfrasen, who is the Chief of Staff of Councillor Jay Robinson. And we would like to start this meeting with opening remarks. So over to you, Mayor John Tory. Sorry, Mayor John Tory, um, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, practice. Just, just did it. It's always, uh, yes, it's always something you have to remember to do. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to all those who've joined in uh, for joining in and for taking the time. I know a number of you have spent a lot of time uh, on this issue, and uh, I, I'm very gratified that you'd be here tonight because I think hopefully you'll find it informative, uh, and we will find it, of course, informative uh, in the context of uh, being able to listen to you. Uh, I am here to listen, uh, as is the case I know with Councillor Matlow and as is the case with our city staff. Uh, I've been doing a lot of listening over the last uh, few weeks and trying to act on the things that I've heard. Uh, but tonight is an attempt for us all to be together and hopefully in a very constructive tone uh, to take a feedback that we get from you on how we can make things better and act uh, on that feedback. I've certainly been trying to do that over the last couple of weeks. I've had many, many conversations with many of you, businesses and individuals, uh, and also been uh, up and uh, been around the area and talk again to businesses and individuals uh, when I've had a chance to do that. And I've tried very hard to act on the things you told me needed to be done. Uh, and I can tell you that I will take a continuing personal inter interest in this as mayor, working with our staff and with the local councillor uh, to do as much as we can uh, to make things better. Um, I fully understand the unrest and the frustration that is felt uh, in the community uh, and that people concerns that people have voiced about this emergency uh, shelter. It, it did proceed on an emergency basis, and there is no question but that that took away from the opportunity to consult. Uh, when COVID-19 began, uh, on express instructions from me as one of the people who co-chaired the emergency management uh, group, um, we uh, took steps starting that first day, whenever that was in March, to make sure we protected our most vulnerable citizens. And that has been a Herculean task. For example, we've literally moved thousands of people. I think the number is about 3,500 people because the existing shelter system, while it could house those people, housed them in a way that was not uh, physically distant from one another. And we avoided largely as a result of our actions undertaken, uh, any kind of outbreak in the shelter system of any magnitude whatsoever. And if you think about it, it's a place where otherwise you might've been very vulnerable to that kind of uh, outbreak. Uh, we faced a similar situation with regard to encampments, which are places that are unsafe, uh, they're unhealthy, uh, and we had to take steps uh, to deal with uh, the housing of people who were in encampments that grew uh, in number over the course of the pandemic thus far. The Roehampton uh, is one of 17 hotel sites that we've activated to stop the spread of the virus, and I'm going to devote more of my comments to the Roehampton because um, the, the Broadway uh, site, of course, as you know, is, is slated to be closed. Um, and so in that sense, I'm certainly quite willing to listen to input on how we can do better and, and on continuing things that we can make sure it finishes up uh, better than perhaps it's gone along. But the Roehampton is something that will be um, in use. The building will be in use for some purpose or other in this regard for a while yet. So I'll devote most of my comments there. And it is one of 17 uh, hotel sites that we're using right across the city in every single part of the city, basically without exception. I understand by the, by, uh, about the frustration that people have faced uh, because of the manner uh, in which uh, this happened in Midtown. And I communicated to city staff, and I say that uh, very understanding of the fact they've had a, an incredible task to perform looking after these thousands of people that had to be moved in one way uh, or another. But I've indicated yep. to them that we simply have to do better in making sure that the wraparound supports that many of these very vulnerable people uh, need are in place sooner 
than was the case with the Roehampton Hotel. And, and really what you want to do is make sure they're in place as early as possible when an opening occurs. Um, this is a bigger challenge when you're in an emergency situ situation, which was the case here, but I know we can do better. City staff have, uh, subsequent to the opening, worked very hard to get those supports up and running, uh, which many of them now are, and I know those supports are going to make a difference. I, I have, as I said, been talking to many Midtown residents over the last few weeks to hear those concerns, and those discussions will continue on my part beyond uh, this public consultation. Uh, I visited Mount Pleasant and Eglinton last week and spent several hours there talking to residents, visiting businesses. I talked to some of the residents of the shelter as well, and to some of the professional staff. And that's how I know they're there, because I actually talked myself to some of the doctors and nurses uh, that are now on the site in order to support and help uh, people who, quite frankly, face some issues in their lives that are as traumatic as any of us could ever imagine. And I know that all of you, because I've, I've talked to many of you, who indicated to me you're very sympathetic to the fact that these people face extraordinary uh, issues in their li lives and require extraordinary support. And that's something the city is uh, dedicated to uh, giving to them. Uh, you will know, I think, as well, that modifications are being made to the building itself uh, to minimize the disruption to the neighborhood, to allow uh, some outdoor activities to take place uh, in, a, in a way that is, uh, you know, within the confines of the property. And my office continues to have daily meetings, of which I'm a part, we are, my office is a part, uh, as is the councillor's office, as are uh, members of senior city staff. So we continue to have daily uh, meetings on this subject. And, you know, I'm not trying to suggest... Um, other things are treated with less attention, but it's it's rare that you'd have daily meetings on something uh, like this, but they're happening and they're happening with a view to specifically keeping track day by day of what's going on. We have substantially ramped up the degree of assistance that is made available to the residents and support uh, on this site. We've ramped up the security to the point where I got a letter this afternoon. I'm not making any light of it whatsoever, but I got a letter this afternoon suggesting we should actually back off on some of that because people were being uh, over uh, policed, but it's one of the challenges of the job that uh, Councillor Matlow and I have is to try and find that balance and our staff uh, colleagues as well. Uh, we have increased the number of police uh, uh, patrols because we have recognized all of us, public servants and uh, elected representatives alike, we have two important responsibilities and they go side by side along with many others we have, uh, first and foremost, and not foremost, first, in, in order, no particular order, uh, we have to keep neighborhoods safe and stable and secure. But secondly, we have an obligation to protect our most vulnerable uh, citizens at all times. My office uh, continues to be in contact with the Toronto Police on a daily basis to make sure that uh, the things they've indicated they will do, which as far as I know they have been doing, uh, will be continued. And one of the things we did in direct response to the input that you gave us uh, was to uh, institute some bicycle patrols so that the bikes were a little more nimble at getting in and out of some of the alleyways and other places that are harder to uh, keep an eye on. And I think in a way that's a less intrusive uh, kind of uh, policing when we do get some of these uh, observations, which I encountered when I was walking around up in the area last week as well, that people were not wanting to have too much police presence there. Uh, as per, again, your request made directly to me, an emphasis is being placed on the evening and night hours because you told me uh, that is when there has been more of the kinds of trouble that uh, has been causing you some uh, dis, uh, dislocation. Uh, I expect to have more such requests to make to these people, along with my uh, public servant and, and elected uh, colleagues uh, when this meeting's over, because we're here, as I said, to listen to you. Um, I acknowledge that adequate uh, security arrangements accompanying the return to school are a very high priority. And planning is underway in that regard. We will do that, of course, in consultation with one another. And by that, I mean Councillor Matlow, myself, Councillor Robinson, uh, and also the city staff and the school board in this case to make sure that we do everything we can, everything that is feasible and reasonable uh, to make sure that the children, your children, uh, are safe uh, in and around the schools, going to and from school and, and so on. Because I've heard loud and clear, I know have the, as the councillors have, you're uh, very legitimate concern in that regard and I commit myself to working with all of those that I mentioned and anybody else including parents that want to be involved in that to make sure that we achieve that result. I hope we can have a good discussion tonight. I've participated during the pandemic in many of these virtual uh, town hall meetings on controversial developments. We're building some modular housing for example in both Scarborough and downtown and um, again some of the people that are going into that modular housing eventually have some issues in their lives and we've had really good constructive discussions. We've been responsive to it. And by the end of those discussions, I can tell you that we have the great, um, the very heartening development that the neighbors become people who are taking an active interest themselves in helping us to care for people who have a lot of uh, things confronting them that uh, most of us can't even imagine. 
I have been engaged with this file for several weeks now, and I intend and I promise you that I will not let up for one moment in terms of my own efforts to make sure that uh, we do everything we can to respond to uh, the concerns that you've raised and to address that priority of maintaining safe, secure neighborhoods, as well as looking after vulnerable people. These are both uh, very important uh, parts of my job and, and Councillor Robinson's job and Councillor Matlow's job. Just in conclusion, I want to say something else that's really, really important. Um, I know that you've been frustrated. I know there have been some uh, heated discussions and I understand that because when it comes to your children and your neighborhood and so on, thank goodness you're all very fiercely protective of those neighborhoods as Torontonians are across the city. Um, I want to thank you though for your patience and for your understanding and I want to thank you for the compassion that many, many of you have articulated to me because you understand that in a city as big as this, 3 million people live here, there are going to be quite a few people uh, that uh, are down on their luck, that have issues that they are confronted by that uh, require our help. When I say our help, I don't just mean the government, I mean the help of their fellow uh, citizens. And I hope that the final, final word I'll say is this, in all these other town hall meetings, people have an uh, urging of the moderator to maintain a very constructive tone. Um, I, I just think that's always important. We're gonna solve more problems and resolve more things and get more things done in the context of, uh, you know, making things better for you and better for uh, the people we serve uh, if we can do that uh, tonight. And I know you will because uh, I grew up in North Toronto and I, and look, all the people in Toronto, I've had a chance to get across the city for the last six years, back and forth, back and forth. Everybody here is the same. We're good people here. And I know that the people in North Toronto where I grew up uh, are good people and they just want to do the right thing and want it to be done right. And so we're going to do, we're going to do that. We're going to do the right thing, but we're going to do it right. And if there's things we can do to make sure we get it right, that's what we're here to listen to tonight. So I will not say anything more tonight. I'm here to listen and uh, hear your questions and they'll be answered by and large by the experts who we rely on to help us with these things. And uh, I join forces with Councillor Matlow and Councillor Robinson in making sure and our staff colleagues to make sure that we do uh, do whatever we can to be of assistance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Tory. Councillor Matlow, Councillor Robinson, any questions? Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, before I begin my comments, I want to acknowledge um, to uh, fellow elected representatives who I'm aware of who have told me that they will be here uh, uh, with us uh, during this conversation, including uh, MP Rob Oliphant, uh, MP Carolyn Bennett, um, uh, MPP Kathleen Wynne, um, and uh, trustees uh, Rachel Tronos Lynn and Trustee Laskin, and I know that the other offices, including uh, Joe Andrew and others, uh, will be um, uh, keenly interested in what we're discussing because they care about this community too. And uh, I also want to acknowledge um, Mayor John Tory's leadership uh, on this. Uh, he and his staff have been, um, he will understate it, uh, the, the focus and the attention that he's given this uh, has been admirable. And uh, on behalf of my, my community, I just wanted to say to John uh, how grateful I am. Um, there was a protest uh, held um, last Saturday. And as you know, I, I disagreed with that approach because I didn't believe a protest outside of a shelter uh, reflects well on this community. But what I heard come out of that event when there became counter protests was that there was a common message which was people want to be safe. There were people protesting because they want the shelter clients to be safe. They want them to be cared for and they want to make sure that they have what they need to be able to uh, be well. And there were people on the other side of the street whose focus and message was that they want to be safe as well. They want to make sure that their kids go to school without needles on the playground and on the streets. And they want to make sure that people's bikes aren't stolen and shops aren't broken into and that people aren't harassed on the street. And when they hear of even more egregious incidents happening in the neighborhood, they worry and understandably so. What came out of those two protests is that I heard firsthand that people from both of those counter protests went over afterwards and made donations to the shelter. This community is a really compassionate and caring group of people and thoughtful. And we understand that we're in the midst of a pandemic and an opioid crisis and a housing crisis. And we have a responsibility to meet those challenges. 
This community also needs the space to be able to demand that all resources and everything that should be done is done by the city to be safe. To care about people isn't being a social justice worker or a poverty industry activist. And to say that you want your family and your neighborhood to be safe is not NIMBY. We all believe in safety and that has been our focus. Now, when I was told that due to the pandemic, there wouldn't be the normal public engagement process that I think everyone would have expected to happen. And in fact, I was disappointed that it didn't happen because less information means more anxiety. And I don't think that helped. But when I was told that, I asked for this meeting to happen. And I'm very grateful to the staff for agreeing to do so. And I believe that tonight is incredibly important because while this should be an opportunity for residents to express themselves, to make their voices heard, to ask questions. This meeting cannot simply be an active listening exercise. It is a meeting to deliver the substantive work that is and has been done to address those concerns. And they know what the concerns are. Mayor Tory, I, and others have conveyed those concerns. Everything we hear, everything we know. I live in this neighborhood. I live here with my family. I hear it directly from my neighbors. I've seen things myself. So as the mayor said, his office, my office, and senior staff have been meeting daily, which is, I, I've never experienced such a focus on an issue like that, a daily meeting, because we recognize how important this is. I'll conclude with this, and I say this to our school trustees who have been remarkable advocates for our kids. They're my, they're my trustee, my daughter Molly's trustee. I think it's great that one of the items that we were able to achieve is that there should be a security plan for our schools. And there was a meeting recently with the trustees and school councils to and discuss that. But our goal, our objective should be, we should have a safe environment in this neighborhood so that that security plan isn't necessary. That's not what we need to be thinking about or wanting to think about when really we're, most of us are worried about how school is gonna start in the midst of a pandemic, that's really where I think a lot of our focuses are. And I know that this whole experience in our community has been another layer on top of another layer of anxiety that all of us are experiencing in our personal lives and, and collectively. So my commitment, and I know the mayor's commitment and the people you see in front of you, is that rather than um, vicar or focus on you know, who, who cares about people or who is NIMBY. Collectively, we should be focusing on solutions because all that matters. And ultimately, I know this community well enough that if there's a shelter that ends up supporting vulnerable people in the midst of an opioid housing crisis and a pandemic, but does not have an adverse safety impact on our neighborhood, I don't think most people will care what's going on in that building. In fact, they're gonna continue, we're gonna continue giving donations and being caring and compassionate. But we also need space and room to be able to vocalize our concerns and expect that they're addressed. And I'll say this, I feel more optimistic that they will be than now than I even did two weeks ago because of the work that I've seen done. Like real resources that should have been there from day one, I'm seeing them happen now. And I hope that this is a learning experience for all of us because there's gonna be more people who need our help and there's gonna be more neighborhoods that expect to remain safe. So I look forward to this meeting and I'll just echo Mayor Tory's uh, um, really admirable comment that let's focus on solutions. Let's be thoughtful and kind to each other and have a discussion about how to make sure that we are all safe, shelter clients and residents alike. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maslow. Um, Rachel, over to you. And Rachel is the Chief of Staff for Councillor J. Robinson. So, hi, everyone. First of all, thank you very much for, for be being here today. Um, so, I, I'm here, Rachel Van Frassen. I'm the Councillor's Chief of Staff. And I'm here with the other Rachel in the office, Rachel Hillier, who I'm sure many of you have spoken to, uh, who's also listening in on the line. 
So the counselor was very much hoping to be here today. Um, many of you know she's she's been working on this issue truly day and night. Um, unfortunately, she's in the middle of a week of um, chemotherapy treatments, and uh, she she's very ill today. So she's she's not able to be here, and I know she's very disappointed about that that she can't be. So. I'm uh, on her behalf, just going to read you a very brief, brief statement. And these are uh, the counselor's words. Um, in July, city staff uh, opened a shelter at the former Roehampton Hotel without consulting or notifying the community. Since that time, my office has received an unprecedented volume of communications. We're hearing about new issues and incidents on an hourly basis. A community consultation meeting is long overdue. If it were up to me, this meeting would have been held months ago before a multi-year lease was signed. As many of the people on this panel know, I am very disappointed that I was not consulted or, or notified in advance. I found out about this new facility through a, a citywide press release after the site had already opened. Although it is located just outside Ward 15, it is clearly impacting the neighborhoods I represent. In recent weeks, I've received close to 500 emails and phone calls about community safety. This number doesn't include the thousands of people who have engaged with this issue through social media platforms. I can see how much you all care about our Midtown neighborhood. If I've learned anything over my years working with this community, it's that bringing diverse viewpoints together to discuss difficult issues results in better outcomes. The challenges associated with this shelter are complex and nuanced. Minimizing or dismissing the community's experiences and concerns is not a constructive way to move forward. I think division is a distraction from the very real issues at hand. Above all, I know that everyone here today wants to live in a safe and inclusive neighborhood. That's what UNITE says. My team and I have been in daily communication with city staff and the Toronto Police about the issues you've been reporting. Recent events demonstrate clearly that more needs to be done to protect the neighborhood, shelter residents, and employees. In the last two weeks, we've seen several incidents, overdoses, fires, weapons possession, and a, and a staff member injured. Well, I've been unable to go myself. Members of my team have been regularly walking through the neighborhood and reporting back. There are very real and urgent safety issues that must be addressed. This facility should not have opened without extensive consultation and first ensuring that the proper mental health services, addiction supports, and wraparound case management services were in place. I truly believe that the city achieves better outcomes when they work closely and transparently with the neighborhoods affected. I know that many families are already feeling a great deal of anxiety about sending their children back to school in the fall in the midst of a pandemic, and this situation has only compounded their worries. I've been working closely with the local school trustees who, who are also very concerned about the upcoming school year and are working actively to find solutions. I recognize that in recent weeks, staff have increased the number of resources dedicated to these facilities, but it's clear we still have more work to do. We're all gathered here tonight with a common goal, safety, and I think it's important to remember that there is more uniting us than dividing us. We all want to live in a safe neighborhood. So those are the counselor's words. And I'd just like to conclude by saying that the counselor stands in full support of this community. And my colleagues and I will be actively listening and following up on all of the concerns raised tonight. Um, and on behalf of the counselor, Council Robinson and our whole team, thank you. Thank you for your engagement and, and thank you for your support and your understanding. Thank you so much all. May I, may I just, I'm so sorry, I was just, uh, it was just brought to my attention that in fact the MPP Jill Andrew is on the line and I just want to acknowledge her presence. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mahlo and Mia Tori and um, Rachel. Um, yes, indeed. And thanks, Councillor Mahlo, for bringing up that other elected officials at all levels are listening in because we're all paying attention. Um, I just want to quickly remind participants that um, uh, today, and this information session in particular is not a political forum. It is a city staff-led meeting to provide you with information and answer your questions and hear your feedback. And we have a lot of city staff with us today. Um,
just to make the introductions a little bit quicker, maybe um, I can read out your name um, and your title. And you, uh, if you're on the panel, please raise your hand just so that everyone knows um, who you are. Marianne Bedard is the general manager of Shelter Support and Housing Administration. Allison Polsi is the director of transaction services in the corporate real estate management division. Justin Lewis is the director of infrastructure planning and development um, at SSHA. Monica Waldman is the manager of Seton House and Junction Place. Nicole Williams is the manager of Roehampton Residence and Scarborough Mission. Mark Wilson is a street outreach programs officer. And we also have Sean Naren, the 53 Division Unit Commander Superintendent. So thanks all for joining us today. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that um, Councillor Matlow, Mayor John Tory, and um, Rachel will continue staying with us until the end in a listening capacity. And if you do have any questions for them or any other elected officials that we know are listening in, um, my team is happy to take them through uh, the project email address, voicemail, or the feedback form, just like we always collect um, feedback and um, work with the respective offices to provide you with an answer today. Um, and uh, just a very quick introduction of myself. My name is Yulia Pak, and I'm here with my colleague Matthew V, um, who's also on the screen. We are part of a community facilitation team retained by the city to help with this community engagement process. Our role is not to advocate for any particular outcome. Our role is to create um, an open process by which everyone feels welcome to share their feedback, can ask questions, and receive the information that they would like to know about the, um, the site. So you, um, uh, you will see me taking notes um, as you provide your feedback. Matthew is also taking notes. Uh, we will produce a very quick summary of what we hear today um, and post it online um, in the uh, next um, few um, days. Uh, you should also know that this session is being recorded and the recording of the meeting will be posted um, on the project website um, in the next few days as well. So uh, just in terms of how today is going to unfold very quickly, Marianne uh, will walk us through um, a quick presentation that shouldn't last any longer than 15 minutes. And after which point we will open the floor for the Q&A session. Um, I will remind everyone again on how you can participate. I see that we have 975 participants today. So we know that we will not be able to get to um, every one of you who would like to share uh, your feedback with us or ask a question. Um, and if you are not able to do it today and if there is no time for us to get to you, please continue engaging with us through the project email address. Leave us a voicemail um, and uh, or uh, share your feedback online with us. All the information is available um, at toronto.ca slash physical distancing shelter. We will also provide that information in a follow-up with you. A uh, few quick things. We are not tracking any personal information right now and we will not be sharing it. Um, I know you were asked to provide um, a name and an email address if you wanted to participate online. Um, just, just, uh, just so you know, we do not attribute any comments to any specific person. We always report in aggregate and that information is not shared or kept. We also ask you, uh, because there are so many of us, um, we also ask you to keep your um, feedback and speaking time to two minutes per question. I ask that of both the participants um, and the staff providing the answers, just to make sure that we can get to as many people as possible. Um, and finally, and more, most importantly, I would like to echo um, the tone that uh, Mayor John Tory and Councillor Matlow and Rachel have said. We have definitely received a lot of feedback and we know there is a wide range of opinions about the shelters. We know that there are those who are opposed to it. We know that there are those who offer strong support for it, but we also know that the majority of people are somewhere in between the two stands um, who care about the community safety, just like Councillor Matwell said. And so we also know that many of you are interested in an open and collaborative process and productive outcomes. And we really hope that um, this session and the beginning of this community engagement process can achieve that. So we ask you to remember that 
many community members are listening. Um, again, we're just over 950 people right now. We're all on all sides of the discussion, so please be considerate in making your comments. Uh, please be respectful. As a moderator, um, any I will mute anyone who is using hateful or violent language or promoting violence. Um, and I think that's it from me right now. So, Marianne, over to you for the presentation. Thank you, Yulia. Um, and good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, first of all, I want to reiterate uh, the words of Councillor Macklow and Mayor John Tory and Councillor Robinson. Um, I want you to know that the city staff understand that the fast pace of establishing these temporary shelters in Ward 12 has led to anger and frustration. We are actively working to address your concerns, uh, the concerns that you've, you've raised, we want to address constructively and compassionately. So thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts with us today and to hear more about the city's overall response to COVID-19 for people who are experiencing homelessness. I'll walk you through a brief presentation that I hope highlights many of the questions that you have asked. And after the presentation, myself and staff will be available to answer your questions. So first of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about homelessness uh, in the city of Toronto. In our last street needs assessment, we estimated that there were almost 9,000 people in Toronto every night who were experiencing homelessness. And more than 500 of those people were staying outside. Homelessness has been on the rise since 2011, and we know that the people who are becoming homeless are staying in our shelter system longer. Even before this pandemic, our system was running at capacity, despite adding more than 3,500 3, spaces in the last few years, which almost doubled the size of our shelter system. The two top reasons that people experience homelessness in Toronto is migration and the inability to pay the high cost of rent. And that's in addition to undertreated mental health issues and the opioid crisis that continues to contribute to homelessness and housing instability. COVID-19 has exasperated these pressures and everyone in the city is seeing increased homelessness in their neighborhoods. This is a sad reality that we are all coming to terms with and why addressing homelessness together is so important. Shelter support and housing. So, uh, sorry, Matthew, I forgot to tell you to move the slides along. I'm now on the third slide. Next one. Thank you. Shelter support and housing administration is the division of the city that manages the emergency uh, shelter system. We oversee 56 shelters operated by skilled community agencies, and we directly operate seven shelter programs. As you can see from the map in front of you, the availability of emergency shelter varies greatly across the city. Our knowledge, our expertise, and our responsibility focuses on three outcomes. Providing people experiencing homelessness in Toronto access to safe, high quality emergency shelter, providing housing-focused supports that ensure homelessness is rare, brief, and non-reoccurring, providing access to housing benefit programs that provide affordability and stability for low-income households. We are not mental health or healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. Providing emergency shelter for people who are experiencing homelessness is a very important community service that is offered across the city. Sites are located within communities, which means that they are more often than not located near other community services that include childcare centers, schools, parks, libraries, and community centers. Shown here is the map of local schools and childcare centers um, and also our emergency shelters. Next slide, please. Many of you have asked how we make decisions on the sites that are selected for new shelters. And so I'd like to spend a few minutes sharing some information that I hope is helpful. People experience homelessness for many reasons. Any one of us could experience homelessness. Every person in our shelter system was once a child with hopes and dreams that did not include growing up homeless in the city of Toronto. 
Our goal is to ensure that there are services in all neighborhoods so that as much as possible, people can stay connected to their community, maintain their employment, and stay connected with friends and family if they experience homelessness. We comply with all city bylaws and the city's housing charter. We work with our real estate division, allowing them to source potential properties based on criteria that we've provided. And once a potential property that meets all the zoning requirements is identified, we assess the suitability of the location for its access to transit, its access to community services, such as libraries, parks, pharmacy, and healthcare services. In 2017, City Council delegated the authority to open new sites to staff. And this means that sites are secured before commencing community engagement. This has been the situation since 2017, and it does continue to be the situation today. In our normal engagement process, we engage with communities after a site is secured and approximately six months before a site opens. And the focus of that engagement is integration of the new program within the community. Next slide, please. Our normal community engagement process is about building a welcoming community. And while the public does not have a role in deciding where shelters are located, they do play a very important role in building a community that welcomes new programs. So after the city has secured a location, we begin our community engagement process with the goal of supporting the integration of that new shelter. And we typically bring in a third party engagement professional so that we can tailor an engagement plan that is very specific to the needs and concerns of that particular neighborhood. Next slide, please, Matthew. I know that everybody recognizes that these are extraordinary times. And as such, they have required us to deploy unique solutions. Since mid-March, the City of Toronto has taken urgent action to achieve physical distancing in our shelter system in accordance with the Ministry of Health guidance for congregate living settings to save lives and protect vulnerable people who are at greatest risk of contracting COVID-19. We opened more than 13 temporary facilities for social distancing, for isolation, and for recovery. And we have successfully moved more than 3,600 people in six months. This includes moving more than 2,000 people into 20 hotel programs across the city and moving 1,500 people into permanent housing through our rapid rehousing initiative with housing allowances and rent geared to income units. We have also insist, uh, assisted more than 700 people who were staying outside to move inside into safe indoor space. Given that our normal practice is to open one and possibly two sites a year, opening 30 sites has been a significant amount of work. Since the onset of the pandemic, we have also seen a rise in outdoor homelessness right across the city with reports of new encampments in locations where we have never seen them before. So although you may be seeing more encampments in Ward 12 and 15, it is likely to be linked to the overall increase being experienced everywhere and not about the opening of new programs. In fact, it is the very opening of these new programs that allow us to offer safe indoor space to people who are staying outside. Next slide, please. This slide shows the more than 30 facilities that the City of Toronto has opened and closed since the middle of March. The programs that have closed were all temporary programs we opened at community centers at the onset of the pandemic. And they closed as the city transitioned into phase two of recovery so that summer programming could commence. Given the number of sites that we needed, the city conducted an extensive search for space. We received inquiries and referrals from hotel operators, property managers, community members, developers, and landlords. And as part of these ongoing efforts, the city secured the Roehampton Hotel and the Broadview Avenue apartments in Midtown Toronto. As you can see from this map I've shown, these two programs make up a small part of our overall response and of our overall shelter system. Next slide, please. 
During the pandemic, we had to implement innovative ways to respond quickly. And our goal was always to save lives and ensure that we did not overwhelm the healthcare system. We conducted our extensive search for locations and in looking for temporary locations rather than permanent locations, we focused on spaces that were more or less turnkey and ready for operational, requiring minimal retrofit. We looked for sites that would allow us to meet physical distancing guidelines, such as hotel and single occupancy rooms. We looked for sites that were immediately available so that we could urgently move people out of our shelter system. And we looked for sites that were close to transit and that were accessible. The two sites in Ward 12 met all of this, these criteria. Next slide, please. So how does Ward 12 and Ward 15 compare to the rest of the city? Ward 12 currently ranks number six out of 25 in wards with five shelter programs and a bed capacity of 290. When Broadway closes in a few weeks, Ward 12 will drop to number 11 with a bed capacity of 172. Ward 15 is not shown because there are currently no shelter programs in that ward. Next slide, please. In normal times, once secured, a site can take one to two years before it opens because of the uh, renovations that are required. And we typically open, as I said, one to two sites per year. Since March, we have opened 30 locations. And while we typically engage with communities after a site has been secured, but before it opens, the nature of our response during this pandemic has meant that we are engaging with all communities after programs have opened. And I recognize that this is not ideal, but it was necessary due to the risk of COVID-19. In addition, our shelter support and housing staff, plus more than 400 other city staff, were redeployed to frontline service over the last six months, making our typical engagement process impossible to deliver. I know that the pace of establishing this site has led to frustration, and we are committed to addressing the concerns raised by the community. And I am also heartened, as Councillor Matlow referenced, by the support that we have received for these programs in the form of donations and welcoming messages. Most of the concerns and the questions that we have received don't strictly relate to homelessness, but to the roots of homelessness. Things like childhood trauma, poverty, mental health, health care, and addiction. These are multi-jurisdictional complex issues and the city shares responsibility for responding to homelessness with other levels of government. And we are actively working with our colleagues at the province and at the federal government to request and to coordinate services that they are responsible for. Next slide, please. So to speak specifically about the two programs in War 12, the location on Broadway is uh, one of the two temporary programs in War 12, and it opened at the end of April. The program was designed specifically to offer temporary housing to people who were uh, living outside in encampments, and the units were vacant because of a redevelopment application that had stalled during COVID. Now that the city is in full swing with our restart plan, that application is proceeding, and the program will close on September the 6th so that um, that site can continue to be redeveloped by the owner. The city is working closely with all of the current residents on, on uh, permanent housing plans. And if permanent housing cannot be secured before this site closes, we will be assisting those clients to transition to alternative shelter programs that have space available right across the city. We have 16 uh, case managers working on housing plans with the, with the clients at Broadway and Roehampton, which is well above our standard. And we are seeing significant results for these clients. We have already housed more than 15 with another uh, number coming towards the end of the month. And this is truly heartening to see. So I don't want to lose sight of the profound impact that this program has had on the lives 
of some people who stayed there, some very vulnerable people, many of whom who have lived outside for many years. It is a tremendous example of how partnerships and innovative solutions can help those experiencing homelessness. Next slide, please. The Roehampton residence at 808 Mount Pleasant Road is the second of the two sites in War 12. The city has leased this property for two years, and we also have the option to extend for a third year. We began moving people into the Roehampton residence in early July. This site provides shelter for single people and couples of all genders, and it is pet friendly. The eligibility requirement for this program is that you are homeless. While many of the current residents um, uh, have come inside from outdoor encampments, now that the program is up and running and at capacity, if space becomes available, people will be referred into this program through our usual central intake process. The Roehampton residence is run by city staff, and we offer case management, housing support, meal, harm reduction, and recreational programming. Since it is becoming clearer that COVID-19 will be with us for at least the next year to 18 months, securing this site for two years ensures us the stability we need during these turbulent times. This is not a permanent site. Our permanent programs typically have leases that are longer than 10 years, or they are owned by the city or owned by a community agency. Next slide, please. People staying at both of these locations are equal citizens of the city, and they have the same rights, freedoms, and responsibility as all other residents of the city. We have conduct expectations and rules that must be followed, and we host regular resident meetings to make sure that people are aware of the rules and they have the supports that they need to meet them. If someone is not able to adhere to these expectations, they are held accountable for their actions and they do face consequences, including the possibility of discharge. If someone is discharged from one of our shelter programs, they are given a referral to another program. We do not just discharge people back into homelessness. Next slide, please. Over the last few weeks, we have received a number of questions about the supports and services available at the Roehampton residence. Uh, in this week's uh, bulletin distributed yesterday, we provided a very comprehensive update on all of these services and supports that are now available or the ones that are coming on very shortly. This includes the fact that we now have on-site medical services, harm reduction, and mental health supports. We have increased our on-site security. We've added mobile patrols and overnight patrols by the Toronto Police Services. We have increased housing case management Management, and we've made capital improvements to install fencing and creating an on-site smoking area. We are working with you to launch a community liaison committee, and we have begun uh, engagement with the local school board. Next slide, please. Regarding schools, I know that there is a lot of anxiety and uncertainty about the reopening of schools in September, and that this has been an added concern. We have met with the TDSB school trustees and local school partners, and planning is underway to develop and implement a school safety plan. As mentioned earlier, having schools located close, close to uh, shelters is not uncommon, but I recognize that it is new for this area. Some steps that have already been taken is that we have now have a cleaning protocol in place where we're checking the alleyways and uh, and roads near the Roehampton residence and Broadway. The community safety team is available 24 seven to respond to schools and daycares and community requests for assistance. And we also have 24 seven mobile uh, patrols con conducting proactive patrols of school properties. So this is the end of our formal presentation. Uh, I want to extend my thanks again to everyone who is joining us tonight. And I'll pass it back to Yulia, uh, who will moderate the question and answer uh, section of tonight's meeting. Thank you very much. Great.
Thanks, Marianne. Um, just a very quick reminder uh, that if you are um, using your computer or a tablet and would like to ask a question, somewhere at the bottom of your screen in the middle, you will see a participant icon that looks like a little human. Click on it, and then um, at the bottom left corner, you will be able to raise your hand. And I certainly see um, we have already 18 questions um, up. And if you're on the phone, uh, the participant icon should be somewhere in the top right. Once you click on it, you will be able to raise a hand as well. For those of you who are calling in, you can press star three and uh, we'll put you up in the queue. Um, so thanks. I, I would like to start with um, a question that we very uh, frequently receive from the community. Um, and the question, and um, the question goes, uh, the question is about uh, the proximity to schools and daycares and seniors housing and how was that considered, if at all? Um, Mary Ann, would you like to answer that? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Yulia. So as, as I mentioned, uh, locating shelters close to schools and uh, child care centers is not unusual. In fact, we even have a location where they're co-located, a child care center and a men's shelter uh, together. So this is not uh, uncommon uh, practice. Uh, we found in all of, locate, all of the locations across the city, we have been uh, very good neighbors with schools and child care centers. Um, and we, uh, we aim to do that in this community um, as well. We do know that there are uh, within a one kilometer proximity to this location, uh, 11 schools and 12 childcare centers. Um, and while this may seem high, it in fact is not among the highest uh, in the city. So again, we will uh, make every effort to be a good neighbor, um, but being located near a school or a childcare center is part of being a community service. And as I said, that is why um, shelters are located within community. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few hands up and um, I'm going to um, go to Lola. Chance to speak. Um, Lola, do you have a question for us? Okay, and I did see her and Matt switch the host position during the meeting. So if he does get it back at some point, could he just elevate him to the panelist role right away? <laughs> Lola? Oh, okay. Let's, uh, let's try another participant. Um, Jeremy. Now. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to lift up the city staff for their efforts and dedication to this. Their work is difficult, underfunded, and emotionally taxing. I can't say how thankful I am for their labor. Um, I live within two blocks of Mount Pleasant and Eglinton, and I'm strongly in favor of the Roham of this use of the Roehampton. Um, I'm also an elementary school teacher, and while the safety of my students is always my first concern, as Marianne Bedard pointed out numerous on in this case, this isn't different, this isn't special, this is how we live in our city, uh, together, side by side. Um, I want to ask uh, Mayor Tory, Councillor Matlow, and any other elected official to support city staff in their work. Uh, scrape every penny you can, they need it. Um, and I was really happy to see a reallocation of the police budget uh, to more appropriate city programs. These programs are what make our community safe. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm wondering what are the next steps in terms of supporting uh, the, our new neighbors? How do we, um, what kinds of other institutional supports are gonna get put in place to help them out? Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeremy. Marianne? Thank you, uh, Jeremy, thank you for those, uh, those comments. Um, this is this is difficult work, and uh, you know the the city staff that do it, and our community agency partners are incredibly uh, committed people um, who who come to work every day uh, to do this work. Um, we will continue to uh, work with the local community through the community engagement uh, community liaison committee to monitor the ongoing issues in the community and uh, problem solve together what some uh, common solutions might be. 
Um, as I said, we now have on-site medical support, mental health support, harm reduction support, and added security. We do anticipate that, um, you know, things will settle down in, in the community. I think it's also, it is worth recognizing um, that as people uh, come inside after living outside, um, potentially for a long period of time, uh, their health and mental health uh, is in a difficult place. Uh, people are sleep deprived and anxious, and it does take a period of time to settle down, to trust that you have a place to sleep, to trust the people who are caring for you in your location. Um, and it is really important for people to feel welcomed into a community. And when that happens, uh, we do find that communities settle very quickly uh, into communities. So, um, you know, we will continue to work with the community to identify what's needed and then work very hard uh, to provide it. Um, and as I mentioned earlier as well, um, it, it is important to remember that the city is doing a tremendous job. And in fact, we are stretching beyond our responsibility and our area of expertise. Um, so we will continue to engage um, the other levels of government and the healthcare sector to make sure that um, their supports are also provided uh, to the residents and to the community. Great, thank you. We have another participant online. Um, Deb. Hi, Deb. Hi there. Do you have a question? Uh, I have a couple of comments, I, more than questions. Um, sure. I have uh, contacted uh, my counselor at quite a bit of uh, length of my thoughts and lengthy email to him. Um, thank you, Josh, for uh, entertaining and responding to my concern prior to this call. What I'm curious about, I guess, and I appreciate all of your efforts in um, trying to um, engage us as a community better to this foreign um, situation to us. Um, I must say, though, I, I am a little disappointed based on what Marianne said, that to me there was an opportunity to at least engage your phase three with the community before opening, as it was 12 weeks from April till July for Roehampton. Uh, that being said, I have made my own observations and have a few suggestions, perhaps, if they're possible at all. But, for example, the vested walkers that pick up uh, needles, um, I think if it would be possible for them to perhaps, as opposed to just what appears to be walk the sidewalks, um, if they might be able to uh, go around perimeters of residential buildings. Uh, the building I'm in in particular, one of our maintenance people spoke to two of them and showed them some of the uh, places that, you know, uh, stairwells, um, nooks and stuff that people might tend to want to migrate to uh, for privacy. Um, but that's only two of however many you have on your staff. Also, perhaps if the vested workers may, uh, if they're allowed to uh, perhaps have candid conversations with uh, neighbors as we do to uh, our other neighbors, again, just to bring us into the whole community, both sides. Um, also, the sidewalk, the sidewalk vacuum. Um, I was thinking again, based on costs, if it was possible that maybe um, the bulk of what I saw on the news recently was that, again, these activities that involve um, needles in particular uh, tend to be uh, in these corners or around where they're not in plain view. So would there be a way to look at, you know, reallocating some of that um, repetitive cleaning that Maybe it could be best suited somewhere else to clean. Um, and then I guess the last item, sorry, I, the last item I, I wanted to uh, express my concerns about, and I understand, Marianne, you have said that um, they are, that these people, and I agree, are equal citizens um, with their um, expected conduct. But we as a community and uh, the businesses, my friends work there, um, myself, um, we're not seeing, and I understand that it, maybe it'll take some time, but it is still where the fear is coming from, from a lot of people that there doesn't appear to be action uh, taken on regular um, minor criminal offenses uh, to business or people. So I guess uh, if there was some 
opportunity even to have something like this form of communication on a monthly basis. I understand again about doing your uh, community liaison. Um, but again, there needs to be some trust rebuilt mm -hmm. uh, with the neighborhood. Those who maybe, again, we are all a compassionate bunch, but when we are dropped into something that could have and is now being addressed, but it definitely needs a lot more uh, community uh, education, I'll say. Thank you so much, Deborah, for this feedback. And um, I, I think it was very helpful. This is exactly the type um, of um, feedback we would like to hear with ideas and solutions for us to consider. Um, Marianne, would you like to address that comment or anyone else um, on the team? Um, no, I just want to. I just want to acknowledge. Uh, you know, the the local feedback from people is incredibly um, helpful. Um, identifying, you know, where those hotspots are and where it would be most uh, uh, effective to deploy our, um, you know, services like our community um, our community teams. So that's really uh, helpful information that we will definitely follow up on. I see Nicole taking notes. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to, uh, to thank you for providing us with that suggestion. Great, thank you. Uh, and I just Councillor Mike to, Cole, uh, yeah. uh, Councillor Mike Cole, can I speak, please? Yes, yes, I was can just I going to say to that, that? Uh, you've joined us. Absolutely. Yeah, first of all, I'm pretty upset that I wasn't included and uh, not even mentioned, uh, you know, that the, the impact of these shelters uh, and the consequences are certainly affecting uh, both sides of Young Street. Uh, not only Councillor Madlow, Councillor Robinson is spilling over to the west into my ward, and I've never been consulted or told of this or updated. And, uh, you know, I've had to rely on security, private security to get information. You know, the Uptown BIA has had to hire private security so shopkeepers can be safe so their staff could come to work you know people are afraid to walk on young street they've been broken into defecation inside their the daycare centers uh never mind the needles the physical threats ongoing and this is all because not because of the shelter uh and the homeless people that we're trying to help this has been a total screw up of total lack of communication of informing people and not even the counselors are left in the dark. So unless you fix that, you can't help the homeless people. And I hope we stop vilifying local residents. I was there at the protest on Saturday because I wanted to hear from people and they feel threatened because they feel vilified because they're worried about their kids and they're worried about their safety. So they're being labeled as anti, uh, you know, uh, homeless. It's, uh, they're not. They're good, decent people who have been victimized by this as much as the homeless residents who've been thrust into that hotel. So let's get that straight and fix this thing and not just try and make excuses. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cole. I think um, it's, uh, it's very much in line with what we've heard um, that we have to work together. It's not about NIMBYism. It's understanding the real challenges that are here um, and working together to solve them. So thanks for joining us. Okay, we have um, other questions. We're going to go to Maria. Maria, uh, thank you. And thank you everybody for uh, providing us with the information and the preparation that you had done for this meeting. I first want to say that um, I didn't hear the word that addiction support was provided to some of these people, as well as mental health. You've got caseworkers, you've got people involved from healthcare, but what about their mental health? And I think that's a big issue that we have to address in this city, not just homelessness. Uh, one thing that I'd like to say is what is unusual about this neighborhood is that we have increased our density of people 2000%, which is really important to remember in the last 10 years, there's been 22 new buildings built that are high rises, anywhere from 26 to 52 stories. 
or 78 stories rather, and every proposal gets approved in this neighborhood. So you're going to have large amounts of construction continuing, large amounts of people moving in. We've got uh, four new towers that are being completed now that are going to house new people. And I think it's a shame that we have to, based upon this urgency and assistance to provide to these, the homeless people, to put them and drop them in the area without the support services that are that could be available to them. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Marianne or anyone else on the team, would you like to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the mental health support? Um, sure. So, so thank you for the question. Um, yes. So those are both of those services are so services that are now um, available. Um, we did have weekly harm reduction support and addiction support at the location, um, and it is now being offered on a daily basis. Uh, we have also, and that's through the help of uh, uh, Toronto Public Health. We've also engaged, uh, I think it's Toronto North or North Toronto uh, Mental Health uh, Services, and they are coming on site as well and, and uh, providing ongoing support for uh, the residents there who have mental health issues. So both of those services are, are ones that are being offered. Uh, they're really important to the residents, and, and I'm really happy to be able to say that those things are in place. Uh, we also um, are starting a partnership at this location with Inner City Health Associates, which is a body of physicians and psychiatrists that work specifically in setting, serving homeless people. So their expertise is a lot of um, some of the common issues around trauma and other mental health concerns. So they're going to be providing services on site. And again, as Marianne mentioned, Toronto North Support Services is a mental health agency, and they do direct referrals for long-term mental health case management support. Thank you. Um, we will now go to um, some of you on the phone. You will um, hear um, a message that you've been un unmuted, so you can go ahead. Hello? Hi. Um, I'm, a, I'm a resident here in Midtown, and um, I'm a mom of two kids. And I'm just trying to understand the process by which people have entered into the Roehampton um, shelter program. So uh, I guess, I mean, there's been widespread reports that, and, and you mentioned it yourself, Marion, um, that um, some of these, a lot of the for former residents in campus downtown. Uh, and I'm just trying to understand when you bring in new people, how do you have a commitment from them that they are willing to um, um, take, you know, take the help that's available to them uh, and try to improve upon their lives? Uh, we've seen a lot of crime. We've seen people getting, grown men getting assaulted at 8.45 p.m. at night. And what I worry about is, you know, you're going to be unleashing 14-year-olds, 15-year-old um, in, a, in a span of two and a half weeks. And how is that 15-year-old girl going to defend herself? Like how is, you know, a 10-year-old boy playing in the park um, at Eglinton PS, you know, sees something or accidentally, you know, trips over it and gets poked with a needle? How is that going to be prevented? I know that you have um, a lot of people saying that, you know, you're going to come in and basically have 24-7, you know, security guards able to respond to um, complaints, but does it become the principal's and the teacher's responsibility to scan the yard every morning? Uh, does it become the parent's responsibility to do that? Like, why is that, you know, now shifted to community responsibility and, and the educator's responsibility to, to worry about that? Right. Thank um, you so much for the question. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So I'll, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll start addressing that. Um, the, the work that we do with people who are staying in encampment begins with our streets to home staff. Uh, some of uh, the most skilled staff that, that we have uh, doing incredibly important work. Um, they begin discussions with people that are staying in encampment, uh, talking to them about uh, coming inside and, and accepting, uh, accepting housing support and also case management support. Part of accepting that is to go through an intake process where they do acknowledge um, that, you know, there 
our expectations that come uh, with uh, moving into a shelter or a hotel program. Um, so there is an agreement from the client that they are aware of the uh, rules uh, that will be in place at the location and that they are willing to, to adhere to those. Um, we, I know that there's been questions about, um, you know, do, do we vet uh, clients and do we deny access, uh, you know, to people who might have a, a criminal history? Um, and, you know, I think, I think it's important to remember that, uh, you know, we, we don't choose uh, who we shelter. Um, you know, we provide shelter to anyone who is homeless, um, and that's very much in line with the City of Toronto um, Sanctuary City um, that we enacted back in uh, 2013. Um, we don't, uh, we provide city services to, uh, to anybody who uh, requests them. We don't require people to uh, um, tell us what their residency status is, and we don't require people to tell us uh, their reasons for homelessness. But we do require people to, to adhere to the rules and the expectations that we have of them when they move into a community, and we do hold people accountable uh, for those. Um, in speaking with the staff at, at Roehampton, um, we have discharged people from that location because they are not able to adhere to those uh, rules. So we are holding people accountable. Uh, we do take community safety very seriously. Um, and the majority of people in those locations um, uh, don't have an issue with, uh, with following those uh, rules and expectations, and they're very thankful to have the opportunity uh, to stay at these locations. Great, thank you. And I think um, the other question that was asked is, whose responsibility does it become and how do you prevent a child tripping over the needle. Um, so I don't know, uh, Nicole, yes. Yeah, I could answer, hi, thanks. Um, we're in the process of developing a school safety plan. Um, we're, I'm personally going to all the schools in the area and uh, we're developing what that's gonna look like. Um, we are committing some of our resources to that. So it, it, safety is everybody's responsibility, but it's not gonna be just on the school. We are taking on um, a very active role in uh, safety at the school. Thanks, and, and I will just I will just add to, to Nicole's point. I mean, these are these are issues that we're facing in every community uh, across Toronto, uh, not just communities with shelters. Um, you know, these these are these are societal issues that we're dealing with in every community uh, of the city, and and that's why. You know, it is important that we're coming together on issues like this and working together. Thanks. We will now go to uh, Dianush. Dianush, you're up. Hi. Hi. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the councillors who are here and the city staff who've been working so hard. And. Um, um, I think most of us seem to be here to find solutions, and uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, and there's two types of solutions uh, when thinking about a situation like this. There's long-term solutions and short-term solutions. And I know that probably most people right now are concerned about short-term solutions, but I wanted to start by addressing the long-term um, context as well, because I think now that there's over 900 people, 900 of us paying attention to this issue, it's a good time to emphasize that if we take proper proactive measures in the first place, uh, we wouldn't have situations like this where we are suddenly dealing um, with a large uh, number of homeless people being new to a community and the community figuring out how to deal with the issue. And so I hope that one of the lessons that we all take from this, including the mayor and councillors um, and MPPs, is the importance of investing more in housing, in harm reduction, in better addiction recovery, my understanding is that right now, if a person wants to um, deal with their addiction, the public system really offers them about one week of detox, and then they're back out uh, with very little support, and they're back out in the same community that they were with people who are using, making it impossible for them to actually have a fighting chance at recovery. Shelters are supposed to be um, temporary measures, but they have become a permanent aspect of our city. 
And so we really have to focus on housing because only when people have housing can they focus on getting better mentally, dealing with their addictions, and uh, perhaps even being able to take care of their families and having jobs. And that's what we should be advocating for. Um, I don't blame the city staff for the steps that they took. Uh, ideally, we always want consultations and raising awareness and transparency, but there was an emergency here. And uh, in fact, many um, advocates uh, would say that the city took too long to take homeless people out of parks or in the um, other uh, shelters where they were sleeping literally one foot away from each other. Uh, so this had to be done, and now we have to focus on what we can do to improve things for everyone. Um, at Saturday's um, protest, uh, there, you know, there were signs saying protect the elderly, protect the children. And I think it's important to remember that children and the elderly are homeless too, and they need our protection as well. So when we've talked about short-term solutions, I just want to address a couple of those. Um, I, I've heard that there's concern about petty crime, and I've heard that there's now um, greater police presence. But I want to ask that we ensure that um, police have parameters uh, in terms of how, how they deal with things. Um, that I don't want to see people who are in mental health crisis being harmed by police. I don't want to see homeless people getting tickets for bylaw infractions. Those are a great waste of resource and homeless people are never gonna be able to pay those tickets anyway. But we know that homeless people get tickets. So if we are going to deploy police, then it has to be done with compassion. And I would ask that the mayor and the police services board direct the chief of police to ensure that the police presence in our community doesn't increase harassment or harm to people who are in crisis. Um, what I want to know is, um, um, I also want to say that I live in the neighborhood and nobody is feeling unsafe walking on Young Street, including my children. When Young Street is full of pedestrians. I don't think people are living in fear and I disagree um, with that characterization. And I talk to businesses and I live in the area. Um, but what I want to know is yeah, how we can help. How, I want to know how we can help um, because this community is full of artists and musicians and doctors and um, other professionals. So I would love to see um, from, um, from the city um, proposals for how community members can provide meaningful support other than donating socks uh, we can provide meaningful support to the shelter okay thank you thank you Dianush. and um, i just want to um, remind everyone um, that we want to get through as many comments as possible um, so please try to keep your speaking time to two minutes um, but thanks so much for for this feedback i don't know um, if, uh, Sean, you'd like to say a few words about um, policing in the community, um, and then we can talk uh, generally about how to get in, engaged moving forward. Okay, thank you. Definitely, I'll keep this uh, short. Um, first off, thank you very much for your comments and your input uh, in regards to the policing and the expectations on policing and the delivery of policing services for community safety. Um, first off, ensure as a unit commander here, yeah, I set the tone in regards to fair, ethical, and unbiased policing. So there's a high expectation on the officers in the area to treat everybody fairly. The members in the shelter are gonna be here for the next two years or several, several, several years and need to be and need to be treated by like members of the community. One of the initiatives that we're looking for for a long-term solution like you've suggested is they've had focus hub models throughout the city that has the city of Toronto, the United Way, and the Toronto Police Services working together to identify issues or concerns or areas that people often believe are completely related to police resources and police deployment, but they're realigned and readdressed either, like you said, mental health care workers, addictive work, addiction workers, um, youth in need, employment needs. So we're working with our com community policing and engagement unit in trying to have one of those focus hubs established within the 53 division community uh, and trying to expedite that because Although everything that's taking place up to this point um, has happened, has brought concern to the community, we have to also look at this as an opportunity as to where do we move forward from this point. We can't necessarily correct um, the changes in behavior or the changes in fear of what's happened on the street today, but the opportunities of what steps do we take as a community and the policing being that part of that community and moving forward 
to address the needs of the shelter, the community safety. I'm fully aware of the school system, the schools, the children's, the needles, um, and the requirements and the expectations on the police. Our aspect in when we're out there attending to the calls is to be neutral and fair to everyone. That includes people in the shelter and people on the streets. And education is a strong format. Another issue, we do have a number of foot patrol officers out in the area, and we are looking for a long-term solution of having that as a permanent basis. So our officers get to know the community, and that includes the members of the shelter as the community, so that we can work together as one and identify issues where we can reintegrate those people who are in the shelters back into the community so that we work as one. And I'll keep my answer to that. Hopefully that, that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And maybe I'll just quickly add um, for the meaningful solutions and how on, on the ways that the community can get engaged moving mm -hmm. forward. We we are developing a community liaison committee. And Marianne, do you want to speak to that? Um, yes, so I'd like first of all I'd like to thank Anoush for, for her comment. Um, and uh, you know, recognize it, it is a really difficult uh, balance for staff to uh, you know, we, we are uh, accused of acting too quickly and we are also accused of acting too slowly. So, you know, it is a, it is a delicate balance for us and, and we do try to, to strike the appropriate one. Um, and also to, to Sean, we, we have an incredibly uh, collaborative relationship with the local police division. Um, they are, you know, highly skilled at working with us and responding appropriately to our clients. And so I, you know, I can assure people um, that, that we have a good relationship there and, and we're working with some really good people. There is a, an email address in, in the bulletin that people can reach out. Um, you know, we, we've done some incredible things across the, across the shelter system. We do offer recreation uh, for clients. And so, you know, knowing this is a, a community with, with artists and, 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 you know, specialists and professionals, there are opportunities to, to volunteer those services. Um, you know, at, at Seton House, uh, we had local musical artists come in and, and do a recording uh, and musical program uh, with, our, with our clients. Uh, we have baseball leagues uh, set up where people come out and, you know, play recreational sports with people who are in shelters. So there are a myriad of uh, opportunities for people to um, come and support the people who are there and, and to give back to their communities. And, and we welcome people's ideas and that's the exact purpose of the Community Liaison Committee. Right, thank you. So Danush, uh, please check back on the project website and uh, get in touch with us if you're interested in uh, being part of it. Okay, we are going to uh, Michael now. Michael. Could you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much for taking my question and my comments. Uh, the, 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 the community consultation issue, it's obviously an issue, but it's not my main concern at this point. What I did find a very disturbing, it was the total lack of advanced planning to support both the shelter clients, the staff in the, in the shelters, and the consideration of the safety of the community. There's been a lot of good actions that have been taken since the opening of the, of, of, of the shelters, but those are all being reactive to the community outcry and to the seriousness of the various incidents that took place. So it is, it is to my mind, very critical how we're gonna measure the effectiveness and the sustainability of some of these measures and to have some accountability from the people who are managing this program towards this community. So my question is to Mrs. Bedard, would you consider proposing metrics that will be reviewed as part of your bulletins as to how the improvements have been made in all fronts, in both in the support of the clients, the staff safety, and also the community safety? Hard metrics, no words, there has to be credibility put in front of us, otherwise the words are good. But as the mayor knows, and as the, uh, the councillors know, it took the death. Michael? Hi, Michael, I think we lost you. Um, I can... I can respond, Julia, and hopefully Michael's uh, able to uh, able to hear the the response. Um, you know, 
first of all, I'd like to say that, you know, many of the things um, will seem reactive. Um, however, you know, we were in, in active planning uh, as we moved towards uh, opening this site. And it, as I mentioned, we were balancing two things. We were balancing, you know, bringing people in from encampments and crowded shelters um, where we needed to protect them from COVID um, with waiting to get uh, supports and services in place. So some of our support agencies had to hire new people. Um, we had to coordinate uh, with uh, our health partners, the delivery of service, um, and we needed to do all of that planning and that was happening simultaneous to uh, trying to set up the program. Um, and unfortunately, many of the supports that are in place now were not uh, ready when the program opened. Um, and, uh, you know, we had to weigh the, the risk of opening the program in advance of those things being in place or, or waiting um, and leaving people uh, in the community without those supports um, anyway, but actually living outside. So, you know, we weighed those two things and we, we erred on the side of, of offering people the opportunity to come inside uh, while we put those things in place. But your, your comment about, you know, being fully prepared uh, is actually absolutely taken on board. Um, and, uh, you know, we are working to make sure that, you know, as we move forward with other sites that we're, you know, continuing to do some of that pre-planning. Uh, metrics, extremely important, um, and more and more the use of, of data uh, is, go, is the way that we're telling our story and identifying ways in which we're actually making progress. So we are absolutely uh, happy to talk about metrics. If there are specific things that the community uh, would like reports on, those are great ideas to bring forward to the community liaison committee, and then we can sort of problem solve ways to make sure we're collecting that data and collecting it uh, in a way that's reporting back accurately. So great suggestion. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Michael. And I would suggest if you could um, email us some of your suggestions for the metrics that you'd like to see included in the bulletin so we can take it under consideration and look at it more closely. Um, thanks. And we will um, go to some of the people on the phone right now. Hello? Hi there. Thank you for taking my call. I'm a member of the community. My name is Ashley. I am actually just wondering in terms of long-term solutions, because I understand that the Brohampton Inn is going to be there for two years. If you have actually started outsourcing third-party facility management companies that specialize in shelter needs, and I'm just wondering if you're taking that into consideration as part of the metrics and operating costs that you're going to have to spend to have that in place. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, thank you for that. Um, so this is a this is a program at the Roehampton that is operated by by city staff, um, and so we do have uh, our own property management uh, staff uh, that are supporting uh, supporting us at that location. Uh, we do outsource the the cleaning and security, but we provide our own uh, on site uh, staffing. Um, but those things are, are all factored into the cost, uh, the daily cost of operating uh, that program for each person. But we do have a level of expertise on, on property management um, at the city. The city owns a lot of real estate. We operate a lot of buildings. Um, and, you know, we operate 11 shelters ourselves and community agencies operate additional ones uh, in our buildings as well. Thank you. And yes, I, Mariana, I, are there, are there, sorry, just a clarification, are there any plans um, to hand it off to a third party shelter operator? There are no plans at the moment uh, to do that. Our, many of our agency partners are also operating at capacity. They have assisted us with opening uh, many of the new programs, the 30 new programs across the, the city. So at the moment, we will continue to operate this uh, as the city. Nicole, I think you wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, a lot of our services are, are third party just because the city can't do this alone. Um, like Marianne had indicated, we had to put it all together. Everybody's kind of um, uh, in a tight position when it comes to staffing and resources. Um, and the existing hotel also has um, roles to play in, in the property management 
and we are very lucky to have a, an amazing property services team that can really help us um, when they have such expertise with uh, managing services. But yeah, um, we, we do already um, use third party contracts because we just couldn't do it alone. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, we will now go to Brian. Uh, hello, I just want to echo the uh, same sentiments that were being said earlier. Uh, I am, uh, I work in the public service myself. I know how stressful and busy all of our lives have been during the responses to COVID. So I can certainly appreciate why you folks had to move so quickly on this. Um, but it's been five months now. And so I think it's a good opportunity to sort of iron out the wrinkles. Uh, I have one question about uh, the, sort of the lines that we've been seeing in the news releases about the community that was released from correctional facilities. Well, I can fully and appreciate anybody that was released um, in, and put on early probation or parole where they'd serve their time. Uh, I, I fully agree that they should be able to live their lives as if we do, a, a regular old citizen. Um, but there were a number of people that were released from provincial remand facilities that were still on active charges before the court. Are there any of those people residing in the shelter? And if so, are they being screened for certain categories of offenses that in, I think most of our opinions would make them uh, sort of inappropriate to live next to a school, like sexual offenses, human trafficking, child pornography, that sort of thing. That's my question. Uh, thank, th you. thank you for that. Thank you for that question, Brian. Um, uh, yes, it, you know, it has been a, a concern of ours since the beginning uh, of the pandemic. Uh, there were some provincial institutions um, that did discharge uh, clients as a way to to manage their own systems, uh, and unfortunately, um, they became residents uh, of ours. Um, we don't, uh, as I said, we don't vet um, clients uh, who who require shelter. We often find out that information about them through case management. Um, if they are on remand with parole uh, conditions, um, I would uh, I would fully expect that the provincial parole office would manage that and ensure that they were not residing at a location that violated any of those parole conditions. Um, but we have been trying uh, trying to get greater coordination uh, with uh, federal and provincial corrections uh, to. First of all, make sure that they don't discharge uh, people into homelessness, that they are working uh, with people while they're incarcerated on a housing plan so that they have housing in place uh, when they're released. Um, and if unfortunately that's not able to be uh, arranged, that at the very least that they coordinate um, with us and, and allow us the opportunity to uh, work with clients ahead of coming into the shelter system. Um, failing that though, we will first of all shelter people and then work with them closely on their case management uh, plan and identify the supports that they need. Thanks so much. And uh, one of the questions that um, we've, we've been receiving over the past few weeks is, can the Rehampton shelter be used to serve women and children in need um, of shelter? Um, thank you. Great, great question. And uh, you know, obviously, we we get that uh, we get that a lot um, when we open a, a a shelter for singles uh, or couples. Um, and you know, the the reality is that uh, this is a population that does need shelter. It's the population that actually we have the highest demand for shelter use. Um, our family use of shelter um, has actually dramatically decreased uh, over the last few months. Um, so the shelter capacity that we need currently is for uh, singles and couples who are homeless. So at the moment, that is the need that we're filling uh, at Roehampton. Um, but we are always, um, you know, uh, looking at the need and, and managing capacity, and uh, you know, we'll we'll adjust if that's needed. Um, but we we wouldn't adjust uh, now because of um, you know the the population uh, need is is there. Thanks. Um, we're going to um, a caller right now. Hello. Can you hear hello. Us? Yes, hello. My name is Pasquina, and thank you for putting this together. I live in the vicinity, and I have lived here for a very long time, also on the other side of Young Street. And I just would like to say that I don't feel unsafe at all. I'm also a cancer patient. I've seen a lot of people evicted from here. The thing that I find very strange is that everybody's talking about one shelter 
and nobody's mentioned all the construction that has been going on with foreign people, lots of men, the narrow alleyways. That has been more unsafe in the last past three years than at the moment. And with COVID, everybody realizes in real time that we've had to move very fast. I even had to have my treatment stalled because of it. And because the city works so fast, which many people don't realize, as you've mentioned how large the homeless situation is, a lot more of us would have got um, COVID if it had not been controlled and it was all done behind the scenes. I have children in this area too. I am a, a recluse and um, because of my treatments and surgeries and stuff, uh, I, I go to St. Michael's Hospital, which has a lot of homeless people. And so I know behind the scenes that the people who are employed really do a very good job. Um, I think Councillor Cole mentioned how oh, it's all on Young Street. I disagree with him because I work, work on that street when I was in his ward. There were a lot of break-ins and things happening um, on Young Street and, and things. It's not something completely new. And with the needle situation, I would just like to ask that Doug Ford puts back in place the system where he closed where people could um, inject um, with safety. And thank you very much for everything. Thank you. Okay, um, I suggest we go to the next uh, person. Marty. Marty, you're on. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you all first for your service um, and for hosting this. Um, I appreciate, uh, Councilor Matlow, your comment comment on uh, at the beginning on the shared need to be safe and to feel safe. I wasn't at the protest, uh, so, but saw it on the news. And I, I saw this, uh, this same shared interest rise up. Um, safety also has to do with feeling safe to express ourselves. So I do appreciate the listening tonight. Um, and uh, it's why I was disturbed at the positional and attributional nature of the pro protest. I didn't think that that brought us forward. Um, so uh, I just want to say that that this is uh, our community, what we're going through now. I am a resident uh, very close to the hotel. It's not uh, in any way a hatred of poor people. I think we, we've come to realize that. It's a sudden and big change. <laughs> and, and, and change is hard for everyone, uh, both in the shelter, and you've expressed that very cogently, um, and, and for, for the community. Um, and, and layers, as, as someone said, it's layers of change. Um, we have interacted with quite a few homeless neighbors over the years and have extended a lot of help to them. It's just that this is an overwhelming and, and sudden change. I was actually wondering if any of our new neighbors are on the call. And if so, I hope that they don't feel othered. I hope they don't, that they understand that this is a big change for us. Um, and that it seems that um, what we're fearing is a criminal element, a lot of drug activity that I think should be a concern, a shared concern for all of us. So um, I want to make an offer. Um, I, I am a mediator and a conflict trainer and coach um, by profession. And I think that in, uh, in my experience, engagement is the key to overcoming otherness. Engagement and talking and listening like we're doing tonight is the way we understand each other each other. Um, so if I can be of any service, I don't have a lot of time. Um, I'm also immunocompromised, so I, I have to do this by Zoom. But um, in terms of dispute res resolution or interface with policing workshops on communication, um, I would be happy to speak to anyone about this. Um, and also, I'm thinking you all have a lot of experience and you're experts in what's needed. So I'm really curious at some point, uh, for you to say what is needed and where are the gaps, what in your experience and what can we do? So thank you again for your service. Thank you, Marty. Um, I think we need more people like this on our 
Community Liaison Committee, so please reach out to us um, um, and let's talk about how to get engaged. But uh, to your question, what is needed um, in your opinion, city staff? Monica? Yeah, so I mean, I think this is the beginning of what I think we all hope will be many more conversations. Um, I have recently opened a new shelter in an area that did not have any shelters before, and there, there was not a lot of support, and there were lots of ideas of what would be a problem and what wouldn't. And I think through um, having a CLC, we were able to uh, create something called an embrace committee. Um, and we have neighbors, businesses, um, the BIA that is actively involved and invested in the success of that shelter program. And I hope that we can replicate that here, understanding that we didn't get off to a good start, but we're looking forward. So some of it is looking at what are the strengths in the community, such as the woman who just spoke, what are things that people are willing to bring to the table to enhance the services? How, what are ways that we can improve communications and have ongoing communication lines? And I, I have faith that we're gonna work through the, the problems and be able to get to a place where things become more dynamic and transformative in terms of um, welcoming people experiencing homelessness into the community. Many folks, like homelessness does not occur in downtown Toronto. People come from all over the city and other municipalities. And the hope is for people to reintegrate into community and not to just be othered. So what are ways that we can look for housing opportunities as ways to engage people as citizens, not just as homeless people in the community that they're coming into? So. There's, a, there's over 900 people tuning in right now. I'm sure that there are so many strengths and so much experience to bring to the table to look at what is needed, what do the folks living at Roehampton want, what do they need, uh, what does the community have, and how can we be good neighbors to each other? Thanks. Um, yes, Justin, very quickly. Hi, just very quickly, I just wanted to echo uh, the comments uh, from Marianne as well as Monica in regards to CLCs. Those meetings will be, once that CLC committee is set up, those meetings will uh, actually happen on a very frequent basis. Usually it's monthly and that, that communication to set that CLC um, uh, meetings up will actually come out in September. So please stay tuned for that information because it's really important if you want to be involved um, and you, you want to, to comment on things that are happening at, at the location, we would encourage you to, to stay tuned and join us in the CLCs. So thank you. Thanks, Justin. I, I think we have um, time for two more questions. So I'm going to go to Dennis. Dennis, you're on. Oh, hi there. Um, uh... I just want to say that uh, I uh, sympathize and uh, agree with uh, most of the concerns that have been raised about uh, the shelter. Uh, that being said, I fully support the shelter at the Roehampton. Um, I'm hoping, I didn't understand what was said about the CLCs, uh, that that might address my, my next comment. I was hoping there would be additional meetings like this in coming weeks, not in coming months, but in uh, in uh, the near future so that we can continue, continue to uh, be fully in, involved and informed uh, throughout this uh, process. I mean, we've had, we have uh, 900 people listen in on this and we've barely been given an hour for us to have our comments. So I think more need, meetings are definitely needed. Um, the information that was circulated by the concerned residents uh, earlier uh, stated that there has been a quote, huge escalation in crime in the area since the shelter opened. And I, I'd like to know if the police uh, data does actually confirm if that is the case. And if uh, I'm hoping that uh, in this day and age, in the digital age, that the biggest police force in the largest city in the 
country has this data available to us and that it will be made uh, public on an ongoing uh, basis. So we all have the same facts at our disposal and uh, we can dispel any uh, misinformation or hysteria there. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. Um, Sean, would you like to address this? Yeah, definitely. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, your question there and your uh, comments. Yes, uh, the the this, the specific statistics will be available on our crime data portal, which can be easily accessed uh, on the internet. Uh, in regards to an escalation in crime over the last several months, um, I'd have to say it's our crime analysis and our uh, intelligence led policing have seen a bit of an uptick in the general area uh, within a 500 meter radius of Young and Eglinton, and hence that's why we've increased patrols, but it's more or less, we have to look at the inclusive partnerships, not only with uh, the Roehampton, uh, the BIAs, you know, we have our crime prevention officer actively working with a number of community organization. And our biggest thing is the opportunity for reintegration and giving all of these people an opportunity to become um, actively engaged in our communities, given opportunities for education, for treatment, and we need to be part of that. And, um, the crime element is sometimes an outreach, what we see of either feeding addictions, whether it comes back to a specific location or not, a lot of them are nuisance or petty crimes, what we look at. But because of the repetitive occurrence, it creates that over fear that crime has gone amok and has gone rampant within the area, which is not necessarily true. Uh, I have officers out there 24 seven on foot, on bikes, in cars, in liaison with the shelter itself making inroads with the different partnerships or the businesses within the area to try to alleviate um, the concerns and the fears that's taking place. But like I said, this is not always a policing issue per se, but on the general whole, like I mentioned before, the focus hub, which is, uh, I gotta get the wording right on this, is furthering our community by uniting services with the city of Toronto, um, United Way to Toronto Police Services to take those people that we either deal with or we can make referral to into the proper services so that they can get the necessary treatment to take them onto another step to reintegrate into the community. So in answer, I know it's a little bit of a long answer, but for the escalation in crime in comparison with what's taken place in COVID, uh, in this area, yes, it's risen a bit, but can it all be attributed back to the shelter in place? No, it cannot. Uh, and that's the simple fact is everything now that happens within the Young Eglinton Corridor automatically the assumption is, well, it must be 55 and 65 Broadway and the Roehampton. And it is not necessarily always back to those locations. We've had B&Es on Young Street up and down way before these shelters were in place. We've had theft models, high-end auto thefts, a number of projects that we've had to alleviate those issues. This is just another element that the community has to understand. This is not all particular to those shelters and should not lay blame towards those shelters. But working together is to address it. Um, and the comment that was said earlier in regards to putting down uh, performance metrics or statistics down the road, we'll have to, yes, they will have to be closely looked at in regards to what is taking place. And if there is a decrease in um, the crime in the area, and I think if there's a greater acceptance by the local community and providing opportunities for these people to reintegrate, that you will see a decrease, a decrease in crime in the immediate area if they start to feel amalgamated or part of that community and take on a community ownership. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to check with Mayor Tori if you wanted to say a few words. Good? Okay. <laughs> About three minutes worth at the very end. So if you want to maximize the time, I think it's 11 minutes to eight. You can still probably take a couple more comments or questions, but I'm in your hands entirely. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, We'll just uh, we're gonna move on. Um, Alan, we're gonna you. Alan, Alan. Okay, I think we have some technical difficulty with Alan. Um, we're we're going to Jane. Jane, you're up. Thank you. First of all, thank you everybody for organizing this. It's been very informational, very useful, and thank you very much for the tone overall. Uh, my one big question, and someone alluded to it earlier, is there an opportunity to open a safe injection site 
right at the Roehampton, which I think would alleviate a lot of the problems that we're seeing in the neighborhood. And then um, a much smaller comment. I was um, right at the site today, and there's one very large garbage bin in front, and it was it was overflowing. So I flagged that as being a health hazard. And there were people out front, and the garbage was absolutely spilling out of this bin. So can we get more bins or more frequent removal of garbage? I, I thank you, Jane. Two questions. One is about safe injection sites, and the other one about the garbage. Um, so I'll let Nicole uh, deal with the garbage question. I, I will address the uh, safe injection uh, question. Um, we it has been it has not been something that we've pursued um, public safe injection sites associated with uh, shelters. Um, I think it further adds to the stigma around shelter users. However, it is something that we are exploring, uh, providing services like that that are specifically for people who are at that site um, as a harm reduction support. Um, we do need a federal exemption to be able to do that. Um, and uh, those discussions are, are underway and, uh, and we also need it to be medically supervised. And so, you know, that, that collaboration is happening to be able to provide harm reduction support to the residents uh, only at that location. Uh, thanks, and the garbage, yes. And I will actually reach out, uh, but those garbage bins belong to Metrolink uh, for the construction. Our bins are at the back of the building, and I did notice that those uh, garbage bins are very full, and they have been for the last couple of days. So I'll, I'll reach out um, on the behalf of the um, on our behalf and the community's behalf because they have been getting pretty full. Okay, and um, we have time for one last comment. We're going to go to Shauna. Shauna, you're up. Hi, I um, just wanted to say again, echoing the comments um, for appreciation and thanks to staff uh, for their efforts in this difficult situation. I am looking forward to uh, getting involved in the CLC. Uh, my question is, I'm wondering if you could talk a little more about the specific strategies and supports that are being implemented to help um, the residents with uh, curbing drug addiction um, and drug use, both in the shelter and in the community. So I know we spoke a little bit about um, you know, weekly addiction meetings, um, but can you talk a little more uh, about specific strategies or, or supports that are available? Thank you, Shauna. Who would like to tackle it on? Monica. Sorry, Nicole jumped in. Um, um, yeah, so, I mean, as Marianne was mentioning, we run our shelters on a harm reduction continuum. There are certain shelters in the city that are designated to be abstinent based, and that's specifically, obviously, for people that are working on their sobriety so that they're not co-located with people who are active users. But really, our approach is to offer a continuum of services work on intensive case planning with the folks that are accessing our services to identify what their goals are, uh, what's going on, if there are some chaotic activities going on in their lives. Um, a lot of um, work around addictions is not just around the substance use, but it might be anything around financial management, income support, um, trauma support, um, and a whole variety of things. So. I don't know that we focus across the board on, on abstinence-based solutions, but certainly when we're engaging with our clients, we would talk to them about a host of options so that they're able to make informed decisions. They're able, like we mentioned with inner city health associates, they're able to meet with physicians who have specializations in addictions as well and can talk about different options for them, be it medically supervised, and certainly also want to work with people who are choosing to actively use around having responsibility around their substance use and around safety for themselves 
um, for the people around them and with the community. And that's what harm reduction is about. It's reducing the transmission of disease. So that would also mean talking about safe disposal of, of drug paraphernalia that you're using. Thanks, Thanks. Monica. And Thanks. I was raised. I know I was raising my hand. I just wanted to thank Monica, so I have to raise my hand higher. Um, uh, but yes, uh, everything that Monica said, and harm reduction does include um, abstinence if that's what someone um, chooses, and we make referrals if that's um, what somebody would need. And Toronto Public Health is there uh, daily to help us um, as more of the experts in harm reduction. Um, so they support us on a daily basis and we have access to many different services. Um, so there's all kinds of ways uh, in which someone can manage their addictions that we support them in. Great, thanks. Councillor Cole. I just wanna say, you know, we're talking about harm reduction. We have to stop the influx of drug dealers and drug pushers that are preying upon the homeless in the area. Uh, my information, from the private security people that were hired by the Uptown BIA is that there has been a number of drug dealers that have frequented the area, are frequently there. So we've got to get the police to stop these drug dealers from taking advantage of these people. I think we're dealing with, you know, the, the you know, sort of the symptoms. Let's deal with these drug dealers that are, are making huge amounts of money selling drugs openly on the street with 15 people lined up to buy drugs, that we've got that on in a photo. That's what we've got to do. Stop these drug pushers from preying upon the homeless people. Okay, thank you. And uh, I know we're three minutes away from, um, from eight o'clock. So um, I think at this point, I will wrap up the Q and A. Um, just quickly in terms of the process next steps, uh, we will, as I said, um, create a summary and post the recording of the meeting today. Please do reach out to us um, uh, about the CLC um, and how to engage moving forward. Uh, Marianne, do you want to talk a little bit about the project next steps and then we will do closing remarks? Well, I'll, uh, I'll leave the time um, to um, uh, Mayor John Tory mentioned that he wanted to say a few words. Um, I would just like to, again, thank everybody who came this evening uh, to begin this uh, ongoing and meaningful discussion. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your compassion and I appreciate your local knowledge and, and expertise. And I think that's going to be critically important for us um, to uh, um, to move this uh, dialogue forward. So thank you again very much for spending uh, your evening with us tonight. Um, information in the latest bulletin on how to get involved and we will keep those bulletins uh, coming so you stay informed. Great, thank you. And um, I know that uh, Councillor Matwell also wanted to do some remarks. Uh, do you want to start and maybe we'll wrap up with uh, Mayor Tory. I, um, well, I simply want to um, thank everyone who's participating uh, in this meeting tonight, both the panelists who are here to uh, be informative and, uh, and support our efforts uh, to ensure the safety of both the shelter clients and the local community. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Sean Noreen uh, for uh, the comments that he's made uh, and all of uh, the work that uh, the Toronto Police Service is doing uh, in, a, in a very, uh, I, I believe, compassionate and, and effective way. Um, I'm just so proud of our community. Um, the, the comments this evening were honest, and they were thoughtful, and they were meaningful. And there were people who called in to tell us uh, that uh, they want people housed, and they want people to be safe, and they want to ensure that anyone who is vulnerable in our city is provided the services uh, with the necessary resources to make sure that they are well taken care of. And they can go on a path that we want for any of the people that we love in our own families. I also uh, really respected the way that people who raised concerns, real concerns, valid safety concerns, did it in a just genuine but respectful way. Um, I know that some people want to hear us get into rhetoric and get angry and beat our chest. Sometimes we feel that way, but I believe the most effective way to move forward and the approach that I've chosen 
is to work in a collegial and collaborative and effective and relentless way with Mayor Tory, my colleagues and the staff to achieve results. I will just close my comment by reiterating what I said earlier. I believe that this community is compassionate and caring. And if there is a shelter in this neighborhood that isn't seen to be the reason for safety concerns, most people not only will not care about what happens in that building, they will step up and be supportive. And I think part of our conversation, and I'm inspired by this, uh, at our, you know, at the meetings that we're holding, is how to include the community in those efforts in a more meaningful way and to ensure that these meetings are more frequent and regular so that uh, people are informed and are able to find a way to contribute in a, in a, in a real way. Uh, also to lessen anxiety and to most importantly address the real issues. And ultimately, and the mayor and I have discussed this, results are what matters. And our entire focus will remain on working together towards results because we want a safe community and that community includes everyone who lives in this neighborhood. And I look forward to working with you as we move forward. Mayor Tory. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, may I just say, uh, you know, every day I have this job and I have the responsibility, of course, across the entire city. So as a result, I've been to many, many of these meetings where, you know, facilities and services and supports that we're putting in place for people are, are located in the neighborhood. And you saw the maps earlier with all the different different dots that represent all the different supports of different kinds we offer and some of them are more controversial than others and so they trot me out um, you know when the controversy that comes about often and I will just tell you that the results of these meetings are always the same and it is such a tribute to this city because in the end yes people are frustrated and they're angry and sometimes they're frustrated for good reason but in the end, when they come together just think about it 900 people tonight came together online and we probably would have been in a room if it hadn't been for the pandemic but these are very effective ways of doing that as well and they're easier to organize sometimes and 900 people spoke just the way that Josh Matlow just said constructively compassionately in a balanced way everybody who had a, a criticism or a suggestion also had an offer of help in some way or other and I'm very proud of that I'll tell you something else that I'm proud of is I'm really proud of our city staff I just want you to know I when you saw that very first slide that Marianne presented tonight just I wish we could go back and take a look at it time prevents us from doing that but I'm sure the slides will be posted on the internet if you think of literally the fact that this team of people represented here tonight, but many others standing beside them, have moved thousands of people, thousands of people to new accommodations to make sure they were kept safe and kept healthy. And I think they've been the ultimate demonstration of our values as Torontonians uh, during the course of the pandemic with the work that they've done. And that continues with the day-to-day -day work that the people right on the screen in front of you are doing each and every day at Broadway and at Roehampton. Um, you know, they are dealing with some people who face unimaginable challenges in their lives and they're doing it compassionately and competently and you know we've heard tonight there were things we could have done better and that's uh, i took long lists of notes and i'm not going to repeat the stuff that i heard here because we are going to summarize it for you all of us together and put it on the internet so you can see that we heard the message and frankly first step in all this is if you think our summary isn't accurate or is incomplete let us know so i just want to say thank you to the staff uh, for uh, their participation. Somebody asked the question tonight whose responsibility is i think they were speaking in particular about schools and so on the answer is that it's ours. And by ours, I mean a team of people, a team of elected people, uh, public uh, servants, uh, professionals that we've uh, brought in uh, and others and working with the community as well. And it is our responsibility. The buck has to stop somewhere. I'm the mayor. It's only one of, of me. You may say that's fortunate. There's uh, more, several councillors, trustees and others, and there's many public servants. And we have to accept that responsibility. You've helped us tonight to understand uh, better what that responsibility is. I think we had a pretty good idea before, but you've helped us with some of the granular uh, aspects of that. Um, we uh, have to be more proactive. We've heard that. We have to uh, plan better, which we're doing. Uh, and especially as the school year starts, which I understand is of paramount importance to a lot of people because they are concerned whether it's for their own children or their neighbor's children or uh, just children in general. Uh, I think you'll find the proactivity will increase as will the responsiveness. I want to say one thing to you. This is totally an editorial comment, but I really believe when you got 900 people together, mental health and addiction. And this is nothing I haven't said to the face of our prime minister in my office when he last visited. Mental health and addiction is at a state right now, which is I can't even think of the words. It's unacceptable, it's unforgivable, 
And I'm not saying that to blame the other governments. I'm saying, though, that your city government, with the resources we have or don't have, cannot address that problem alone. It's part of the health care system. And what I said to the prime minister is I hear these promises of deals they've done together, the two governments, and thank goodness they're doing deals like that, to put billions of dollars towards mental health and addiction. And I just said to him, I'm sorry, sir, I just don't see the evidence of that in terms of the treatment programs and the kinds of things we need in order to help people. We lost 27 people in the month of July alone to overdoses in the city of Toronto, 300 people last year, 300 people. If you think about that relative to the rate of homicide, which we found unacceptable, and it is, uh, relative to the rate of pedestrian death, and that's unacceptable. We've got to get those numbers down as close to zero as possible. The numbers of drug overdose victims were way in excess of that. And that is not something for us to be proud of. And I say us, I mean all of us, collectively, all governments together. So I would just ask you to advocate to those other governments uh, because we're trying to do our part and there's probably more we can do as well. But the resources have to come through the healthcare system uh, to meaningfully address that. And that's going to play a big role in addition to economic uh, renewal and poverty reduction in, in addressing some of the things we've talked about tonight. You know, uh, this is an area of town, I, as I said at the beginning, I grew up in this area of town. I lived there for almost 50 years. My mother still lives on Broadway, right two doors from the, uh, the shelter we've been discussing there. And it's been through a lot and still going through a lot. If you combine the pandemic, which everybody's experiencing, the extraordinary rate of growth, which people, the councillors here and, and myself are trying to help to manage better, uh, the transit construction, which of course has, has been, I mean, it's going to produce a wonderful thing at the end, but it's a nightmare to go through it. It's been going on a long time. And then add to that uh, the, the um, effects of having these shelters to support our fellow citizens. It's a lot. And so I understand that that leads to frustration as well. And I just want you to know that I'm very mindful of the fact that you've had, you, the people and your neighbors have had an unusual amount to deal with in terms of all these things. And there's probably something I've forgotten. I just want you to know that the message is not lost on me that the you know principal issue and uh, Josh mentioned this is safety and security. I think the compassion is there. The, uh, the community liaison committee is going to get lots of offers of help and we're going to see happen what happened in every one of these that I've been involved in as kind of a, 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 a the comforter in chief and the person that's trying to get some action on things that they get uh, fall between the cracks, which is the neighborhood actually adopts these shelters in the end. That's the word I use for it and before you know it. There are people actually in those facilities uh, having games nights with the residents. And uh, I was at one downtown and they were in doing Christmas decorations at Christmas. And, and this is the kind of thing that, that really is a, the epitome of what we're about as Torontonians. And I hope that will come to pass. I realize it's, we've taken a rocky road to get there, but I think we can get there because that's the real uh, Toronto spirit. Um, I wanted to say that I understand completely the need for a very, very uh, detailed and thorough and proper school plan. Uh, and I will just say to you, if the liaison committee isn't ready, uh, even if it is ready, I will commit right now and use my own uh, influence to, to the extent that I have it uh, to make sure we have some meeting uh, resembling this to discuss the school plan so that at least there's a chance for people to hear it uh, and to comment on it. And, and of course, we've only got a limited period of time before that plan has to go into effect. So I'm just going to make that commitment to you tonight and I'll deal with the consequences of that uh, tomorrow, as is often the case. Um, Last but not least, I just want to say thank you to you again, the people who have attended this meeting. Um, you know, to turn out 900 people is an, ex an example of, of, of course, how much people are concerned about this, but it's also a great example of citizen engagement. And I'm not surprised at that in North Toronto, um, but I'm just delighted that people came out because we heard a lot. Uh, you have the opportunity, there was a slate up earlier on on the screen about email addresses and whatnot, and I hope you'll use that and use my office, use Josh's office, Mike Cole's office, everybody else's office, Jay Robinson's, uh, to communicate with us. And I'm going to, in turn, keep communicating with you as I know the others have been doing. So again, thank you very much. And and uh, last but not least, certainly, Julia, uh, you have done a superb job uh, with a, just a totally even disposition and totally orderly. And I think your tone helped to set the tone for everything else. So thank you for the job you've done in moderating this meeting and to those who helped to put it together. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you all. I am aware we're 10 minutes over. So um, thank you all for attending and I look forward to the public meeting summary and the recording of this meeting on our website. Bye.